We are in Genesis chapter 12. I figured if I, if I waited, Mike said he was going to take the class. Um, so I was, I was going to kill time and see if he actually would do it. Let's begin with the word of prayer and then we'll pick up in chapter 12. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you've given us this chance to study your word. We ask that we would learn from it what you'd intend, that your truth would, would come forward. We ask that we would also consider one another and encourage one another as we study together this evening. Let us all be more like your son as we go through this life, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now we read at the end of chapter 11, uh, in, in Genesis 11, verse 31, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, or I, I don't know how you say it, Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. And then 12 verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And we'll read the rest of that in a bit. So where did God send Abram from when he said, Go from here over here? and show your work. Well, don't point at the slide, that's cheating. Why not? Because it's cheating. Rich. So Rich says er, Mary says something with her finger. Are you pointing at the map too? So Mary's pointing at the map. Mark and Mary are just, Roger. So we're, we're told in Acts 7 and verse 3 in Stephen's speech that uh, God appeared to Abraham uh, while he was in Mesopotamia, which is in Ur. Right. Ur is that. And then told him to go out from his land when he was there before Abraham. Right. So for, for those of you who didn't hear what, what Roger said, is Stephen in Acts chapter 7, when he gives his defense to the council, says to Abram, when he's in Ur, which is, which is where Mark and Mary pointed at the, at the beginning of the arrows on the map, I want, you to, I want you to leave everything and I want you to go over to Canaan. So what they did is they went from Ur to Haran, or Haran, where, um, uh, where Terah's brother is, and then they spend a little bit of time over there. So when Abram leaves home, his dad and his nephew go with him. And then, and then his dad dies up in Haran, and then, then they go down to Canaan. Why? What, what's the point of even bringing that up, other than, than, than look at how smart we are? We, we know where it's referenced in Acts. For me, I think the point is looking at the time frames in Hebrew history, because, because we're used to history written in such a way it's, this happened on this date, and this happened on this date, and this happened on this date, and this happened on this date. And it goes in chronological order, right? That's, that's, how we're, that's how we are used to history. A lot of the Hebrew history we have is not necessarily in chronologic order. It's more of, I want to talk about this event, I want to talk about this event, and I want to talk about this event. So the way I remember it is, is have you ever had that granddad who tells stories? Now, when I was eight, we did this, but, but when I was 15, we did this, and it ties together in my mind because this, and he, and he transitions using the word now. Now I want to talk about this. Now I want to talk about this. Now I want to talk about this. In the ESV, in chapter 12, verse 1, it starts with now. Not now as in this instance of time. It's now as in I'm transitioning, and I want to talk about this now. We got, to, we got to keep that somewhat in mind because we're not looking at a chronologic event or, or, or chronologic specific this day, then this day, then this day, then this day history. Now, if we, want to, if we want to see that in the New Testament, we look at Luke. 
But if we want to see that in, in Hebrews writing, it's just it's just not there. It's more talking, I want to talk about this event, I want to talk about this event, I want to talk about this event. Does that make sense? Is that just me picking nits? Adam says yes. All right. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. This is a linchpin verse, I think, of all of Scripture. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you... Here we have three promises to Abram. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Those three promises to Abram, the nation, the blessings, and then all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. I think all the rest of scripture is based on this paragraph right here. All the rest of it is, is showing how all this comes about or has come about. All the rest of scripture builds on this. So the first part, the nation. I'll make of you a great nation. What's that nation? Somebody say it louder because I'm old. Israel and all the, yeah. Okay, obviously Israel, right? Is it, it and, and then Mark said all of this. So, so Mark's going to speak in sign language and I'm gonna point at the map and I'm yes. going to make broad sweeping gestures. So, so what's, what's this? Tribe, tribes of Jacob? Of Israel. Okay. Does anyone disagree with Mark? Is that a great nation? Does that fulfill God's promise to Abraham, to Abram at this point? Okay. And what else? And prove it. Someone not Roger. Roger can do it too. All right, Roger can do it too. Who, who, who else? Who else is this great nation? Yes, sir. Us, because in the latter part of that verse three, it says, "And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed." Well, who is that? That's Christ. Okay. Yes. So that the promises to us. Too. We are we are direct beneficiaries of this promise to Abram just like just like everybody else is now for the for the descendants of Abram if we look in Romans chapter 4 verse 11 uh, we're talking about Abraham we're talking about his righteousness we're talking about what he's received in 411 he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised Abram was faithful while he was uncircumcised God said, be circumcised as a sign of that faith. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So was Abram spiritually, figuratively, our father? Yeah, he's the father of the faithful. We've called him that. So when he says, when, when God tells Abram, I'm gonna make, you, I'm gonna make of you a great nation it's Israel. Spiritually, it's us, if he's the father of all who believe. And incidentally, is there another great nation that comes out of Abraham too? That that's not really what God intends here? Yeah, he's got this son of a servant woman, which poor Sarai, and we'll get to that in a little bit, that, that also becomes this mighty nation. So that's the first promise. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. Does God bless Abram and his name throughout pretty much all of history? Yeah. I, 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 I think we can't really overstate how God has blessed Abram's name. Um, I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I'll curse. We grew up hearing, I'll curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will, will be blessed. And we already touched on this a little bit, but we see it um, 
as far as all the nations of the earth will be blessed, we see that coming through Christ. And there's, and there's a couple of verses. If you want to write them in your, your margins, we can. Uh, one of them is in Acts chapter 3, uh, in verse 25. Acts 3, 25. You, uh, this, is, this is Peter speaking. Um, defending themselves you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers saying to Abraham and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed God having raised up his servant sent him to you first to bless to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness we see that this is this is talking to Jews explaining to them what this blessing to Abram really meant and that it manifested in Christ and then again we have in Galatians chapter 3 uh, beginning in verse 14. Galatians 3.14, uh, talking about curses, everyone who is hanged on a tree, obviously referring to Christ. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, all nations being blessed, uh, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brethren, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and your offspring, who is Christ. So these three promises we have at the beginning of, of Genesis 12, where God says, Abraham, I want you to go over here. And I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna do these things. All the rest of scripture prove these things. All the rest of scripture, I think, ties to these things. Um, any questions, comments on this first paragraph? Verse four, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Morah, at that time that Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar uh, to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an, an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. You could have Negev or Negev. Um, basically, we're just we're seeing Abram's travels. That he started over in Ur, he went up to Haran, and then he came back down into what we know as Canaan or Palestine, or ultimately becomes Israel. Quick question: Why did he go up and over instead of straight across? He would have died in the desert. That, that's where everyone went was up and over. It's what we call the Fertile Crescent. Um, that, that's, that's where all that travel went. So he goes up and he over, up and over, and we see him traveling around a little bit in the land of Canaan. In verse 10, now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter We'll come back to it. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So you say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because, uh, because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful, and when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So we go to Egypt. How old is Sarai at this point? How old is Abram? <coughs> What's the, what's the last age we saw Abram being? 75. So how old is Sarai? She's 65. She's 65 and Abram's worried that she's going to be so pretty that he's going to get murdered over her. Now, is he, is he being unreasonable? Debbie says no. Jennifer says no. Why not? 
Yeah, Pharaoh did take her. She's so pretty that this stranger who comes through the land, the princes of Egypt say, wow, she's really pretty, goes and tells the Pharaoh she's really pretty, and he goes and he takes her. So, so he may not be being unreasonable, but, but what, can we, what can we learn from Abram here? Is he being untrusting? I think so. I, I think so, and it's easy, it's easy for me to look back on it and say I wouldn't do that, but who knows? May, may, if, we, we all deal with fear, right? Abram's dealing with fear. But God made these promises to him, and Abram's trying to help him along in his own wise way, which we see him do a few more times also. Now, is it an out-and-out -out lie that Sarai is his wife? Oh, sister. It is an out and out lie that she's not his wife, but it, is, is, is she kind of his sister? Yes. Yeah, we see it in chapter 20 when he does this again with Abimelech, and, and he winds up explaining it then. What's the explanation? That she's a half sister. They have the same dad, but they have different moms. And that, yeah, that's why I said that. That's why I said that she was my sister, Roger. Yeah, a lot of times we, we talk about whether it's a lie or not a lie, and I think um, I'm not sure that that particular distinction is terribly important because the scriptures don't just tell us not to lie, it tells us not to deceive. And he's clearly using a half-truth or, or a partial truth to deceive. Out of fear, right? You know, and, and and you know we can probably understand that sometimes we might have said something that's true, but left something out so that we know people got the wrong impression. And and we intentionally let people have the wrong, yeah. even though we think that we didn't out and out lie. Right. But that but that brings up the good point is is why did Roger say that we that we do it too? Yeah. Out of fear. Who here Who here is? I mean, almost every time that, that we lie or we're tempted to lie or we tell a little white lie, it's, it's out of fear, more often than not, isn't it? And yet, the number I've heard is 365 times in Scripture we're commanded to not be afraid. But we see that even, even Abram, who was accounted righteous, still dealt with this fear. So, Pharaoh sees Sarai takes her, and then winds up giving Abram a bunch of stuff. And I, I'm, some people think it's like a dowry, that, that you're the brother, I'm going to take her, I'm going to marry her, I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff. I'm not necessarily sure of that, but Pharaoh's in a position to bestow wealth upon Abram. And if he likes his sister, maybe he's giving Abram gifts because he's the closest male relative at the time. But in 17, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? And why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him that they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So, so how does God afflict Pharaoh? I, I found this probably more interesting than it should have been. Plagues. With plagues. Isn't it interesting that Pharaoh, even way back, is, is getting plagues on Egypt because of God's people? I mean, already? The, these Egyptians just, they have problems with, with the Israelites, with the Hebrews. They constantly have problems with them. Um, how did... Pharaoh know that Sarai was Abram's wife? Around, around the same time, at least the plagues are triggering it. We don't know. Now, in chapter 20, how does Abimelech find out? Yeah, God says, look, I've kept you from being inappropriate with this woman because of this. 
So, so God tells him directly. We don't have that indication with Pharaoh. I mean, it could be something as, as simple or as mundane as Pharaoh asking, how come I've got all these plagues coming on? And Sarah, Sarai says, well, it could be because I'm really married. Um, we don't know. I think some people want to go too deep and, oh, what, what did God do? What didn't God do? Who did what? Who said what? We just don't know. We, we've got to go off of what's written. Now, one thing, one thing that I don't know is the ESV, um, in verse 19, said, Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Reading it that way, what does it sound like? It sounds like Pharaoh married her. Now, does someone have a new King James? Mark? Yeah. This doesn't say. Does it say? Yeah, she's my, uh, why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. That's the difference. I might have taken her. So, is there really a difference? Yeah, well, ultimately with how it plays out, I don't think there's a difference. But, and, 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 this, and, and this is just kind of speculative, if Pharaoh took her as his wife, think about everything that Sarai went through for this relationship with Abram. Twice, at least twice, and we see in chapter 20 that, that Abram says, you know, we just, that was just our story that we told everybody that, that she's my wife. But at least twice it's detailed that Sarai, sister, you guys know what I mean, that she's my sister. So at least twice she has to lie and say, I'm his, I'm his sister. It's possible that they are engaged in a, that she has to pretend to be Pharaoh's wife. Possible. Possible in this instance. But we also know that when they're trying to help God along with his promises, that she gives over her handmaid. Hagar to Abram to take as as a wife and then Hagar holds it over Sarai's head that she's got a kid and Sarai doesn't have a kid so so this whole relationship to Abram is tough on Sarai Roger um, also the concept of taking her for a wife we see in the Song of Solomon as well as in the book of Esther fairly long processes before actually taking them as the wife. Right. So they, they, they've taken them to their palace, but there's a lot of time that <clears throat> transpires in preparation for that, that, uh, that marriage. Right. Um, and so even if, um, you know, the Hebrew, and I haven't looked at it directly, but even if the Hebrew is more, you know, taking it for the wife, which I suspect the ESV is probably a little more accurate to the original. Um, it, it might be just he's taken her to start to, the preparations of marrying. So, so you you mentioned looking at the Hebrew. I looked at the Strong's, and I didn't see a strong indication, strong indication, one way or the other, whether it was actually taken as a wife or to or prepared. Even if it was only to be prepared for the wife, to pre be prepared for marriage to Pharaoh. What's going through Sarai's head? Is she? at least fearful of the fact that she might have to marry this other guy when she's already married to, to Abram. It's this, 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 I, I kind of feel for her. She suffers in this relationship. She suffers because, frankly, of Abram's fear. In these instances, she suffers because of Abram's fear. And our fear can have the same impact on those around us, on, on those that we're close to. She chose to lie also. So she, she did. She suffering too much. Well, I... She did. She did. That's a, that's a sticky situation for a wife. Right. So, so is she trying to honor her husband? Right. I, I, I think Abram's decision here just makes things hard. I think, their, I think their marriage suffers a lot of stress because of some of the decisions. Not just Abram makes, she makes it too. Because remember, who suggests that Abram takes Hagar 
I was, that was her call, and she comes to rue that as well. Rich. I think that it's interesting that God stepped in in both instances. Mm -hmm. two instances where it was like he would have thought that maybe she'd learn from this first one, that, or both of them might have learned that this may not be a good thing to do. And then they did it again and took a memo out. And then that time, I mean, we don't know how the Lord warned her. We know that plagues came upon the house of mm -hmm. Pharaoh. But we don't know exactly how Pharaoh made the connection that he did. Right. And then with Abimelech, either Abimelech wasn't as smart as Pharaoh and couldn't get it, but God directly tells him. So it's kind of like it, God stepped in both times, which is, which is interesting to me. So, all right, let's, let's apply that. Do we all sometimes have faith like Abram? Like, we really want to be trusting. We really want to do what God tells us, and we wind up messing it up anyway. Are there times, looking back on it, where God has made intercession for us, that he's helped us in ways that we may not have recognized at the time? I think so. It, I, that this is where I think I get encouraged by this, because I'm fearful and dumb, too, but I see God still having mercy on Abram, protecting him sometimes from his own choices, and then still shepherding him toward what he originally wanted. We, we see that Abraham's a work in progress, much like we Oh, yeah. Very much so. Um, okay, so, so Pharaoh gives orders, get him out of here, send him away. And then we see Abram going back to... Uh, Canaan. Anything in chapter 12? Roger. I was just going to mention uh, the fact that Abram, Abraham and, and Sarai prepared the deception ahead of time makes me think that something like this has already happened. That this sort of temptation for a, a really powerful leader to just take whoever they will. will. I mean, there's no there's nothing there. There's no army. There's no police to kind of protect him. And, and you know, and when he comes to a place where, where the, the, even though he has obviously a very large household, a very powerful household, he doesn't have anything like Pharaoh's, you know, right. nation or probably even Abimelech at this time. And so, it seems as if he, they're, they're 75 and 65. This probably isn't new. It, it, in a sense. I mean, the fact that they prepared, because if, if it never happened before, why would you have prepared for it? Usually you only prepare for it when you kind of already have some experience. Well, he tells, he tells Bimelech in 20, you know, I'm going to this land where, where they don't believe in God and they're a bunch of faithless reprobates, so, so we decided to lie to them. And, and Bimelech, I don't know how he takes that, like, hey, I'm right here trying to do what's right. You're getting me in trouble with your wife. But it sounds like I, I think that's what it says in chapter 20 when, when Abram tells Abimelech, hey, we just had this story prepared. We read about it twice. But it's like this, this is what we were telling people because Abram's leaving everything that he knows. He's never been to these lands. He doesn't know what he's getting into. And his wife, he thinks, makes him a target for these, for these leaders. So, so maybe he was legitimately concerned, doesn't make it right. Adam, you had a hand up. This, I mean, this is absolutely happening right now in Afghanistan. This very thing where people are going around and killing the husband and taking the wife and taking the daughters. And so I think it's a very real thing. I think the fear is very real. Um, and it just, I don't know, I guess I'm thinking about, you know, having that resolve to, to not deceive and tell the truth no matter the cost is an incredible thing. Right. You really think about it. Right. Yeah, that, I think that's a good point. Anything else? Chapter 13. So, uh, Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. 
Negeb, Negev. Does anybody else have diff- have something else, a different word there? The south. The south of what? So he's going north from Egypt into the south. Yes, that's all the word means. It just means the south. It's the southern area of Canaan, the southern area of Israel. So when when Abram goes north from Egypt into the south, he's entering the southern portion of Canaan. Okay, Um, so so that's, that's all that word means. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at uh, an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen's, herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And that, at that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. We know this story, right? So, uh, verse 8, Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord uh, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So we see, um, we, we know the story, but we tend to think that the, the, the way we read it, at least the way I grew up hearing it, is, is oh, well, Lot looks over here, so I'm going to go over here, and Abram looks over here and says, I'm going to go over here, and they can still see each other from where they, from where they settled, right? That, that's how I kind of grew up. That's the impression I had growing up. But if we look at it, over here is Zoar and, and Sodom. That's where Lot goes. He's all the way on the other side of the Dead Sea from where Abram is, about where that green arrow is. So he's kind of on the other side of the country. They're, they're not just in neighboring counties. They really do spread out. Um, Part of that's because I think Lot sees the land that's over there, and, and that's where he'd rather live. But part of that could be reflected of the size of their households. And we know, we have, we have some inkling of Abrams, and, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. But if, if Abrams got enough herdsmen to fight with all of Lot's herdsmen, we're talking massive households just within those two relatives, and they really do need to separate and create some distance between those two households. Any comments on this? I mean, we, we know this fairly well. Okay. Uh, verse 14, here we have a reiteration of, of God's promise to Abraham, or to Abram. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from where or look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. I hate this fly. Um, thank you. So, so what's Mamre? We read about the Oaks of Mamre in the Old Testament all the time, right? What's Mamre? It's not, it's not on the map, so you can't point at it and gesture more? <laughs> Ma- Roger. Uh, some, some identify it as possibly Hebron. That's the location. But at this point, Mamre is just a guy. We, we think of the Oaks of Mamre being this region of Mamre with all these massive trees. Mamre is just a dude. 
And we're going to see it when we get to the end of this next chapter that Mamre is a guy and Abram goes and pitches his tent near this guy. And we see winds up being an ally with him. So, so God reminds Abram, all this land is going to be yours. Everywhere you look, I'm going to give it to your offspring. Just, just a reminder. Um, in 14, another story that we, that we know somewhat, uh, verse 14, chapter 1, or verse 1, chapter 14, verse 1. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Now, where's Shinar? We've, we ran into that name that last week. Shinar is the valley where they built the city of Babel. So if we've got a king of an area in Shinar, they're, they're from over here in, in the Babylonian era. Area. So these four kings in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shimabur, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So, so we've got these four kings coming from Babylon, coming over here to Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's, and there's like a line of cities south of, of Sodom. There's these, um, these five cities. The four kings from Babylon come over and attack these five guys. The, these five kings of these, of these cities. In verse 3, And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedorlaomer, this king from the Babylonian area. But in the fourteenth or the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in, Ash, in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in Sheva Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran and the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hamazon, Hamazazon Tamar. So these kings came from Babylon and they came over and they're just establishing their authority. They're whooping up on people and they're reestablishing you guys belong to us. In verse 8, then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out. We keep calling this little town Zoar. Do you know what Zoar means? It just means little. When Lot escapes Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and the angels send him away, and, and remember Lot makes this appeal, we'll get there, but Lot makes this appeal, hey, can't I just go to this little city? See, it's just a little bitty baby city. Can I go here instead of out into the wilderness? That's where he's asking to go, and that's how they know it as Zoar, which just means little or little town. So, um, verse 8, these kings of these cities went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now, the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits. We talked about this before. What's a bitumen? Tar, or, or asphalt. They used it to make asphalt. It, it could also be pitch, like uh, Noah put on the outside of the ark. So there's tar pits around there. And the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, so the kings from Babylonia are whooping up on them, and as they fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their, and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. So these kings from Babylonia come over and they whoop up on these, these cities over here on the east and southern end of the Dead Sea. They whoop up on them. The kings of those cities run and they, and they flee. They go into the hill country. They fall into tar pits. They do all this stuff. And now they're scattered. The kings from Babylon go to those cities, take their stuff, including Lot, and then they're going to go back and go home. Um, let's... Let's finish out this, this section real quick. In verse 13, Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. This is the first time we read the word Hebrew in Scripture. What does Hebrew mean? Hebrew. 
It means pilgrim. It, I think literally it means one from beyond, somebody from somewhere else. It's a stranger, it's a pilgrim. In this land, Abram's the pilgrim. So the one who had escaped came and told Abram the, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite. See, Mamre is an Amorite. He's the brother of Eshcol and Aner. These were the allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. What do we know about Dan? Dan the man. What do we know about Dan? Rich? As far to the north. We're going to read throughout the rest of the Old Testament language referring from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is the northern border of the kingdom. Beersheba is on the southern border of the kingdom. So Abram takes his men, his 318 men, born in his house, who are trained to fight. Maybe they had other jobs, but he can muster 318 people in his household to go whoop up on these other kings when he needs to. That's the size of Abram's household. So he, he chases them as far as Dan. Verse 15, he divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. So these, these multiple armies from Babylon, Abram whips them, sends them scattered. Then he, brought all, then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen, Lot, with his possessions and the women and the people. So Abram takes his servants and we see that he takes Mamre and his, and his brothers with him to his allies. But he goes up and he whips up on these kings and takes back everything and every one that they took from Sodom and Gomorrah and those, and those cities there when they, when they beat up on those kings. And we'll get to the important part here next week. What's a little fascinating is um, that's Binti, having Binti Dan here in Genesis when that's not the land that Dan was given. Dan was given a land in the middle of Israel, um, and but they couldn't destroy the people there, and so they went and killed some peaceful people way up north and took their city. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's interesting that they, that their, their scriptures essentially take that change that happens in the time of Joshua, and, and it, it ends up coming essentially being giving them a sense of how far he had traveled using their sense of right parameters. Yeah, and we and we'll see it throughout this that that in in the history and in the law we're we're using names that don't really get established until after Joshua which is just fun to look at. It's interesting. Way more fun than this stupid fly. Um, any, anything else before, before we close out? Um, we're about to get overrun. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Let's sing song number 415. Song number 415, Each Step I Take.
Faithful Love, number 18, is the song we'll sing after the invitation. Good evening. In the way of announcements tonight, um, Julie's memorial service will be held here at 10 o'clock on Saturday. And uh, we've heard from uh, the Tatalos and Smiths, um, Katie has another infection uh, of a different sort. They are treating it with a new antibiotic, and that does seem to be helping, so that's good news. Um, and they were hoping to take her off of the ventilator today. Uh, we did not hear how that went, but we're hopeful um, that that happened. Scott is still not doing well, unfortunately, but uh, the good news is that uh, Ben has recovered quite a bit. The kids are, as I understand it, almost entirely well um, now also. So um, they're working through it with God's help, so it's good. For the invitation, um, it, it hit me that I must be getting old because I hear a bunch of sayings lately that kind of just rub me the wrong way. I find them very trite and empty, and of course they're new. So, uh, the one of them is that I need some me time. You know, I've never heard that before. Or how about I need to practice mindfulness? Or um, I want to be the best version of myself. Those are all things that I've, I've heard within the, like the last 10 years. You know, I just didn't hear those phrases before. And they just sound so, so you know, I don't know, abrasive to me. But it's because I'm getting crotchety. Um, I'm taking after Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you can combine these and it becomes really awful. Like you could say, I'm feeling empty, so I need some me time to practice mindfulness so I can be the best version of myself. <laughs> You know, just shudder. Right? Uh, now, I'm not really trying to be insulting to anybody. Every generation has their trite sayings. I don't even know what my generation's trite sayings were because I think they're wise, right? Uh, uh, and the fact is that most of these sayings have something true in them, right? There is something real. They're not really completely trite. They have a purpose and a meaning. Um, like, for example, the... the uh, I want to practice mindfulness. Well, there's a couple of flavors of that. There's the, I want to be in the moment all the time, you know, here, present. Um, but there's also m practicing mindfulness as in meditation. A Christian word for that is prayer. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. Being mindful, speaking to God, our thoughts, right? There's something true at the core of that phrase. Tonight, the phrase I want to really focus in on, though, is becoming the best version of myself. And I went to John chapter 2 and looked at Jesus' first miracle to kind of see a parable here of becoming the best version of ourself. So I'm going to read John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the, to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the, br the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this is Jesus' first miracle, and it's unique in that he never repeated it. It wasn't like he healed somebody or disappeared into a crowd, which he did a bunch of times, right? This is one he only did once. 
So let's break down this miracle a little bit. Water is common. It literally falls from the sky. We spray it on our lawns. It's so bountiful in most parts of the world. Um, and it's also tasteless. Yet it is essential and unimaginably important because we couldn't live without it, right? Wine is valuable, right? It requires tending vineyards to produce it. You have to juice the grapes, ferment the liquid. You have to clarify it. You have to age it, and then it's wine. It's flavorful. It's saved for special occasions. Psalm 104, verse 15 says it gladdens human hearts. And so compared to water, it's comparatively rare. It's highly valuable and special. Now, it can be dangerous, but that's not really what we're focusing on uh, tonight. So this miracle resembles Christ's mission. There was a need, right? He was salvaging a banquet. The bridegroom was about to be embarrassed. The wine was gone. Only Jesus could solve that problem. He took something common, something but important, which was the water, and he transformed it into something special and transcendent. Even for wine, it was special wine. There was a need on earth. Sinners are common. There are a dime a dozen. Every single person is one, <laughs> right? We're morally tasteless without the guidance of God. And yet, they're unimaginably important because every single one is a soul created in the image of God. But through his death and resurrection, Jesus transforms us into something special. We're valuable as saved souls who will be with God forever in eternity. The faithful are comparatively rare. We are meant to gladden human hearts by spreading the gospel. We are meant to be living, to be the best, most righteous, and godly people that we can be. We are flavorful in the knowledge of God and filled with his spirit. In short, he turned and, in his, and is turning us into the best version of ourselves. Only Jesus can make that transformation, just like only Jesus could turn that water into wine. Without his healing work, the forgiveness of our sins, the gift that he gives us of the Holy Spirit, we cannot be our best selves. So the question is, are you ready to be your best self? Are you water? Are you ready to be wine? If you're ready to be transformed through the power of Christ, you can do that tonight. You can be baptized in water to be washed in his blood and your sins to be taken away. You'll become a new person, a new man in the image of Christ. If you have that need or any other, we want to be able to help you. We want to be mindful for you, I mean, pray for you and help you in any way that we can. If we can, please stand and come forward as we stand and sing.
This time we'll be led in our closing prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for blessing us, uh, blessing us through the day, Father, but blessing us with our lives, especially the lives that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can walk through this, through this life saved. Help us to uh, act like we're saved people while, we, uh, while we're out there, that we would take opportunities as they arise. Father, we, we know that you will continue to uh, bless and protect us and uh, help us to be wrapped up in your scriptures, learning more of your word and, and uh, learning more about you from them. Uh, be with us, Father, as we leave here tonight. Uh, help us to be safe. In Jesus' name.